Howdy boys and girls from Spectator 6. Welcome back to part four of our deep dive into gaming realism series. We'll be looking at uh, the role of vision and perception. Uh, now I've had a lot of false starts trying to put this together. I'm sick and tired of doing that. I got my note card here. We're just going to do it live together, okay? We got uh, three things we're going to try to touch on, big categories. This will be stability, field of view, and then an in-depth look at eye versus head movement. Sound cool? Let's go. So first up, this idea of stability. I'm gonna I pulled this video off a guy, uh, JTC Films. So we're gonna take a look at this together real quick. For those who may not be familiar with what I'm talking about, um, this is with a stabilizer. All right, and it kind of smooths out the view a bit. This is without a stabilizer. You notice there's a lot of jostle and stuff. Okay. This is something that comes up a lot uh, in films and movies. Um, you see, uh, you have steady cam, these are big. Picture like these big apparatuses, these are sometimes motorized and stuff, a lot of counterweights and things like that. These big old things that help keep a smooth and even keel for a camera, right? Compared to, if you look at something like a Saving Private Ryan, it's used in some of those types of movies. Um, there are certain scenes where they use a, a steady cam to give that uh, viewer the sense of bounce and motion, right? If you want to go like super extreme, you can look at something like a Blair Witch Project. The whole thing was intended to look like it was shot on just a, you know, a handheld camcorder, right? Um, and it can be convincing, though it's kind of one of those things that uh, can be a little bit problematic for some people. For some, they can be drawn in. They like that sense of motion and movement. It helps them feel like they're there. On the, there's another, cat, uh, for other people though, uh, whatever they end up on the spectrum, right? For some people, it throws them off they get kind of a, a sense of a nauseous feeling almost. Like, um, because they're, they're seeing a certain thing, their body's expecting to kind of feel certain motions, and because they're not able to feel what they're seeing, that kind of, uh, whatever you can call it, desync or something, right? It kind of just throws, throws, their, throws their inner ear and the sense of balance off, right? And it does give the sense of nauseous, nauseousness. I mean, if you go, this happened, I mean, think way back when, not too long ago, when uh, EFT, and I don't have a I don't have a clip here to pull up. I'm sorry, but it's like when uh, EFT initially tried out uh, its weight system. One of the things they did to kind of help convey to the player the sense of starting to you know be overweight or being over encumbered uh, and kind of just being overexerted, right? Was they added this slight kind of up and down tilt of the camera. And this is I mean even for me, someone who tends to kind of like a sense of head bob and motion and the view. That, I mean, even for me, really threw me for a loop. And I, I can, I can, that's my, one of my first times to ever sense what I've heard some people say. is just this, this sense of kind of dizziness that comes from that, right? That's a big no-no, okay? So uh, playing, uh, playing with that kind of thing is, uh, is a, can it be a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing to get right. Um, there are some standards that are out there. Um, I'm not going to dive too much into that. What we are going to look at, um, I do some sim racing, and some of that will be how it applies to sim racing. So let's, uh, let me pull up something here, and we'll look at this together. Ba-bam. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> okay, first up, I'm leaving with this. So this idea of uh, a stabilized view, this exaggerates. It's, it's an old Mercedes-Benz commercial. They're showing it with a chicken, right? The way the chicken, no matter how the how the ground is tipping or turning, right, the chicken's head is right there, stabilized to keep the view, right. Um, let me keep. I'll talk some more about this, but let's keep going. This is um, an old, an older one now. It's it's uh, a set of Corsa. We'll look at a couple. This is a set of Corsa, an, old, an older an older racing sim now. But here we go. This is with it uh, with Horizon Lock. They call it Horizon Lock. The stability um, with it on. What I want you to see here is how, this is a repeat, but what, you, what I want you to see here is if you picture the horizon line in the center of the screen, what it's doing is um, it's allowing the player's head to more or less kind of stay, stay locked with that, and it's letting the car and everything jostle on its own, like independently, right? Compare that with something like this. This is with it horizon lock off. So you'll see here, it's more like it's tracking uh, with the actual uh, character model's head itself, right? That's what's driving these motions, okay? Yep, so there we go. Another one with it off real quick, so we can just put it side by side. 
Mm -hmm. Now, with and with sim racing, this is kind of a, this is kind of a big deal because part of being uh, immersed in a sim, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, this will be field of view, and this is kind of this is going to be a big one, uh, controversial again, but. Uh, Again, I go back if I go back to what we looked at in part three, where the whole idea here is if we're going to make player movement become like a front and center hallmark aspect, uh, more detailed thing of movement, um, what a player is able to be aware of and what they're able to perceive becomes actually quite important, right? So uh, we're just going to look at this uh, here. FOB, I, I might ramble a bit, but let's go. So here we go. Let's say we have a landscape view, and this is, if you look closely, you'll notice this has a little bit of a fisheye effect going on. You look at the grains of the grass, it's coming towards you, then it kind of flattens out until it's a, a, a horizontal. So if we see here, this camera has somewhat of a fisheye bubble lens, right? So you actually, uh, maybe it's like a 180 type view, is maybe so, right? But, so this is, this is a kind of wide angle, obviously, right? But what's interesting here is if you take some time and um, consider your own eyesight, your actual field of view is much wider than we think. It is almost a straight up 180, almost, as far as what you're able, like the limits of your perception, right? So like right here, if I put my hand straight out to the side and like wiggle my fingers, I can actually see that movement on my right side. Same with my left side. And if it is literally like straight up, uh, almost a 90 degree, right? I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. Now, would I, assent, would I know what that is, per se? No, but I can, I can sense there's movement there, right? Um, and so this landscape idea, if I'm not going to go super, I mean, if you want to read about this, you definitely can, about how the eyes work, uh, limits of perception and stuff. Um, you know, you got your rods and cones, you have your focal point. This will be different from for different people. There's kind of a general standard, right? So let's just add it up, let's say, a shade. Um, and this could be, uh, again, I'm just approximating here on the screen, but this could be um, somewhat of like, let's say, an approximation of what I'm trying to say is a limit. Let's say like a general vague, this is where things tend to be more aware, right? Uh, where I can not only see movement, I can and colors and stuff, but I can also maybe take pretty good guesses at what the object is without actually averting my eyes and focusing on it. Right? Um, if we go even narrower still, right? This will be even narrower still. Right? So you, again, this picture of graduated deal, wider, right? The more narrower you get, the more closer you get to this focal point, this exact focal point of your vision, the less guesswork you have to do. Right? You can only take in vision, also make out objects without actually uh, focusing your eyes, right? Now, what becomes interesting here is let's say we overlay, I overlay like a monitor, okay? And this is where the field of view as a concept becomes a little bit uh, controversial. Is because what you'll see is, I mean, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a programmer, okay? But... Uh, there's a lot of programmers from what I've read that tend to like, let's say anywhere from 20, uh, like a 24, wide, 24 inch wide angle, uh, wide, wide view monitor, tends to be what they, what they like, it's a sweet spot. Not very many people approach or go beyond 30, right? And what I'm gonna show here is kind of why. Um, it's because if we take a monitor, we'll see that um, there's a certain size of monitor, again, it depends on how close or far away you are, right? But there's a certain monitor that tends to be an ideal for most people where it's comfortable, not only for the viewing uh, like distance, but it's also um, at that comfortable viewing distance, they're able to kind of stay in the know as to what's going on. This is the same reason why, um, you know, a lot of people don't like sitting right up to their nose against like a, a movie theater or something, right? So it's the same concept here. There's a certain distance where people just, in general, feel more comfortable, right? They can take in the scene without missing things. So if we were to, uh, yeah, oh, I'm misdriving here. Here we go. So this is a rough guess. Don't. This is not to scale. I'm just trying to give get a rough guess for a conversation, right? So let's say we have our head superimposed here. 
can I fade it out? So I get rid of a Okay. So let's say there's our head, right? Um, as, as a rough guess. There's our monitor. Let's, let's take some of this stuff off. Let's say we're at uh, our monitor here, right? If you were to look at, man, wouldn't it be cool to play on a monitor that's huge, right? And like you've seen this, you've seen people, some people have played with projector screens, right? And on the face of it, it'd be like, oh, wow, cool, I'd feel like I'm really there. Um, yeah, but. It's uh, kind of sort of, right? It's, it puts yourself at a big disadvantage compared to someone who's rocking a monitor that's like this, right? A huge disadvantage, right? So there is this um, idea of if we, say, if we say this is what it's like in real life to take in a scene, let's say more or less, um, what happens is they, that field of view, entire field of view, that would normally stretch out here, gets scrunched and squished down to a size like here, right? And obviously, if we go back to our shades here, you'll see that these start falling within uh, kind of those focal things I was, I was showing earlier, right? Um, this is where the advantage kind of comes from. Um, are you with me so far? That makes sense. Um, and it's kind of, I guess what makes it, oh, that's what I was going to show the next one here. Let me show one more. One more. Um, turn this crap off. Okay, let's show this here. Now, this, this again is kind of a guess as, as to what I use to get this image, right? And this is kind of a game you can play with yourself to see what it's like for you. If I, so this at this range, it's kind of my comfortable range for monitor. If I focus uh, on the center of the monitor, and I get like a width of what that monitor looks like. If I, again, still, still look forward. If I take that monitor width and kind of mentally kind of scooch it off to the side where it's the same width again, that total angle is a kind of about where, um, is about that, ed, that same edge of my view from earlier, right? So that's, I mean, everything, of course, it's on a curve. It's a curve in real life, uh, if you want to get super technical. Um, but if we're just looking at just a flat plane, let's say, again, that stretch is about that same monitor width of play, a little bit further. It's, it's further still, but that's a rough guess. Right? Um, okay, so with me so far, that's a little bit longer than I want it to be, but here we go. I said one take, nah, I guess I lied, right? I uh, turned, During a break this morning, I thought of a really great way to uh, drive home what I'm talking about here with in regard to FOV. Remember the uh, the L, not this one, but uh, this one. You do like an L7, right? <laughs> and you do like a frame, and like you picture like you were, uh, you know, going through and like you're like you're shooting your own uh, your own movie, right? As you take in certain scenes. What I want you to do is, if you do that same type of a uh, a framing, but you do it more or less uh, the size of your monitor, right? The idea here is that as you as you look around, right, with this shape. What is this uh, L7, what is this framing supposed to represent? Is it supposed to represent whatever thing gets compressed down to, like we showed earlier? Or is it supposed to represent like a window out into the world, right? And if we think of anything with like filming, that's generally what we think of. When we frame a shot, that's kind of what we see. Now, when we look at something like a first-person shooter, or racing sims, or what kind of jump, any, anything first-person related with, with the view and perception, right? That's kind of the icky, tricky, icky, sticky spot to go through is if you were to do a really, really, uh, really, really narrow field of view, right? Like I'm talking, depending on what I'm doing, if it's a single, double, or triple monitor setup. I mean, if it's a single, I'm doing some on, we're talking like it'll get down to like, you know, w below 30 horizontal, depending on, depending on the monitor that's uh, being used and how far away and stuff. So that's a really, really small window to view things through. However, once you uh, let yourself get into that and just stick with it for a while, as far as the racing sim stuff goes, it starts feeling very realistic because there's no disconnect between having things squished versus it feels like you're just kind of peering into this, uh, you're peering into this aquarium, right? And you're seeing like, oh, that's what it feels like. That is the feeling I get in real life of driving a car, right? Now, which is cool, okay, but, 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 the it obviously can work well with racing sims because you're not you know scanning around looking around unless you're doing some online stuff maybe then then they have little HUD 
HUD elements to help you see who's around you uh, going, going too far. When it comes to first-person shooters, though, obviously the periphery becomes a lot more important. If you picture driving, especially at a closed circuit, you're just looking ahead and just steering, right? It's very kind of uh, more stationary activity. You're sitting down, you're just looking straight ahead. Maybe you glance left or right to kind of look look ahead at the apex, right, as you're turning. But more or less, you're kind of stuck in this in this groove, right? Whereas first-person shooters, you are more looking around more. So the question then becomes, what do you do with the periphery of this L7? Uh, if you tighten it up that closely, how do you, there's still a lot of information that is lost, okay? Um, so um, that's something to consider, right? Uh, there's some things you can maybe play with. You, I think it was uh, Red Orchestra 2, a Red Orchestra series, or maybe it was the Arma series. That's kind of, it's all blending together a moment now. I think it was Red Orchestra series played with the concept of having dots, right? I think even Arma did this to a certain extent on one of its, maybe it's the mod or maybe something like that. But what it was doing was it would put, even if you have this tighter, this tighter, more realistic uh, perception, right? It would play with putting uh, dots around the edges to signify friendlies or foes, right? So even though you're here, right, and you're in your view, in real life, you are, like we showed earlier, you are aware of movement way, way out in the edges, right? So it's trying to kind of supplement and give the player a more of an indication of what may be going on the periphery. Maybe something like this could be uh, with like a, a shader or something like this or some type of a, a visual effect where maybe the, maybe the bulk of the shot is like this, but you play with the edges and the edges could be almost not a fisheye, not like it's a gradual, but just a really compressed, just a kind of a band around the edges, right? Where it feeds in that extra peripheral view gets kind of scrunched into there. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? It's just enough to give the player to be able to sense motion, maybe sense some colors and stuff, and have to actively turn. Now back to your regularly scheduled program. This next will be eye movement uh, versus head movement. And I try to think of how I could show this. This might be uh, this might be a little bit creepy, but we're going to try it this way. Okay, I'm going to look at I'm going to look at get closer to the camera so you can see my eyes. And once I show you what I'm what I'm talking about, you can do this yourself. But let me go through it a little bit. And I want you to focus on is my eyes. Okay. So let's say with my eyes, I want to look real quickly to what's like a comfortable range of motion. So it'd be here and here. Okay. It's so like old school Wolfenstein guy, right? Looking side to side, right? That speed is very fast, very fast. And that, that angle is about like this, maybe just shy of 90. It could be 90, maybe just shy of 90 for me, right? Now, here's what becomes interesting is that comfort range of where my eye, if I go, I can go further, let's say, but my muscles really can have to start, I feel a lot more flex in my, in, the, in my eye wall, right? In the muscles in my, eye, in my eye wall, right? To really stretch it over, right? Now, what's interesting, and I don't know if this is true for everybody, but for me, that comfortable limit coincides with my dual vision. <laughs> this is getting kind of weird. But by dual vision, I mean what gives your sense, what gives us a sense of depth in our view is our eyes both looking those two frames of reference and how our brain makes sense of all that, right? Um, if I were to turn my head to that same limit, it's about right here is where it is for me, that looking to the side is about right here. That is also that the same range of motion when my other eye, this one, is obstructed by my nose, right? It's that same moment in time where the, let's say, the off side of the off, the off eye right, is no longer engaged in viewing this object, right? Now, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that is uh, a scientific, you know, I don't know if there's a reason for that. I would have, if I'm just speculating, I'd assume it has something to do with, what's interesting here, and this is where it'll be kind of fun, is watch this, if, and try this yourself, right? If I look, and I'll do it, I'll do it a few times, and just, I'll talk about it here in a second. So let's say I see something off to the side, and I want to look at it. I want to go way off to the side and look at it. Now, what do you see that happens? It's very interesting. I'll try to go super slow. Here's what happens. First of all, my eyes close. 
They want to protect. They don't know what's quite there yet. I think instinctively my eyes want to close. My eyes know where that position is. They look in my head that way, right? And once they arrive there, my eyes open, right? And then my head kind of goes, right? Does that make sense? It's a slight blink to cover, to protect. I'm sure it's just an instinctive thing to protect, right? That goes. Now, okay, you might be asking, what the hell does it have to do with anything? Okay, stick with me. This is really cool. Um, we'll get there in a sec. The other part that's interesting about this that I want us to see um, is go back to that chicken thing, the dancing chicken, right? And play, this, play with this yourself. If I focus straight ahead, watch this, and I turn my head to where I'm kind of getting myself side angle views, right? This is what's so fascinating about the way our brains stabilize our view. Even though I turn to the left or right, and technically, even though my focal point is now off to the side, right, relative to my head, the way it's perceived by my view is that it's still in the middle, okay? And try this with yourself. Again, find a point and kind of just adjust things and let yourself kind of see how this plays out. No matter where my head is kind of angling and turning, my mind makes sense of the view as if it were still, as if it were stable. The whole part of this is to make it stable. Does that make sense? And that is very freaking cool. Now, what does that mean? Let me go back to this view. Now, what does that mean when we consider something like uh, this? Let's go back up and what this means is, looking feels very snappy, okay? I don't see, it doesn't feel like a wipe, like this. Like, pretend that's where I'm looking. I'm looking to the left. I don't feel my vision wiping from side to side. I feel it snapshotting. Like, boom, it's here. My eyes close instinctively. Boom, it's here, right? Boom, it's here. Boom, it's here. Does that make, do you follow me there? Um, our vision itself does not feel, unless you're actively scanning, right? Unless you're actively like scanning your crowd. But even then, if you pay very close attention, it's not a smooth motion. It's jagged. Your eyes jump from one, two, three, four. Maybe it's a muscle thing, I don't know. But it jumps. It skips, right? Now, uh, I don't want, this is a fascinating topic, uh, I don't want to go deep into it, but if you want to dive deeper, it is because vision is an insanely complicated thing for our brains to make sense of, okay? There's an old, I don't even know what it was, an old radio show a long time ago, I, I, they did a good deep dive into this, where they, <laughs> I said I wouldn't talk, let me talk, just, oh, where they talked about blind people who were born blind, who were later in life given the ability to see, right? And what was fascinating was how their brains were not able to make sense of what they saw, okay? You picture like these old Van Gogh or Mo uh, like a Van Gogh or like a, a, an abstract art picture piece, right? With all these little geometric shapes and all these weird angles and stuff. That is how the world looked to them. So when they looked at a person's face, they didn't see eyes and a nose and a mouth. They, their, brains visual, their brains did not know how to segment out and make sense of the different objects. So what happens was, what's happened was they were literally overloaded. It was an information overload. It was too much. They would look at someone talk. They would see a mouth move, but it wouldn't be a mouth that was moving. They would just see things. It wouldn't make any sense, right? It would, literally would not make any sense to them. And what was fascinating was, again, if you go back to the way we develop as infants, as babies, the way our brains just supercharge and grow at very, very fast at the beginning. They're saying, like, scientifically, that is why that part of development is so integral, why all those synapses and all those wirings in our brains are just, I mean, just blooming at a super high, high rate. How a lot of that deals with vision. 
um, and how you get someone who's at later stages at stage in life, their brain is not able to wire that up. It can't make up that lost ground. Okay, so uh, TMI. I apologize, uh, but it's I think it's a fascinating deal. Let me see what else we're doing. Okay, so we talked about the wipe, right? How we talk about it's wipe versus a target, right? My brain, like I know where that is. Like I talked about in the, like I talked about before in the other one. Like I know where this is over here. I like my proprioception, my body's awareness. I know where things are. If I look at my, I know where that is. I don't have to scan, 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 and find it. I already know where that is, and I can just go right to it, right? Okay. Um, um, so where am I wrapping up with this? I'm wrapping up to kind of say this is what I'm exploring now, is this idea of you can maybe see it as like a shading or uh, shading a view, shading a perception. Will this play out well in a game? Ah, that's the million dollar question. Um, if I could, I didn't do a good job of explaining in part three what I meant by kind of the programming side. Okay, let me try again at that. Uh, one quick little interlude. This is going way longer than I wanted to. Here we go. So one quick little interlude would be to explain this idea. Is in a game, in a first-person shooter, everything it's called an update cycle. Every stinking frame. The game is updating, 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 and rendering, update, rendering, update, rendering. So all these algorithms and all these uh, functions that are run to calculate all these things, right? The myriad of things are updating every frame, every frame. So if you have, you know, 120 FPS, 200 FPS, 200 times per second, this is being updates being called, right? So what does that mean? Okay. <laughs> what does that mean with how these things are programmed in a game sense? It means that, uh, to go back to a view, a mouse view, I cannot, uh, let, me, let, me do a, let me do a dramatic thing, uh, see if this makes sense. I'll, I'll, drama, I'll dramatize it. Okay, so I'm sitting here and my computer's going to ask me, uh, Spectator 6, where do you want to look, right? Oh, well, I want to look over here. No, 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 the computer says. No, 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 stop. You can't tell me, like, the end. You have to tell me where you want to look in the very next frame. And it's like, oh, uh, very next frame? What do you mean? Like, like, like just a little bit? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Where do you want to look in the next one two hundredth, two hundredth of a second? And it's like, what? What the heck? No one looks around that way. No, no, but that's what the game wants to know. No, but tell me, where would that be? Okay, well, it would be here. Okay, where's the next one? Here. Next one, here. Next one, here. Next one, here. Right? It's this constant dance of where have I gone since the last frame and where am I trying to go? It's always behind the curve, right? The player gives us input, things resolve. Input, resolve. Input, resolve. Input, resolve. The only, it's, so in that way, it's very dumb. Okay, It can't be intelligent. I can't intelligently say, no, I'm trying to look there. Pause. Stop game. I want to tell you, I, let me show you where I want to look. And then you can resolve it. Okay, now the game knows enough to make a smart, intelligent pan or an intelligent look or an intelligent movement or motion, right? That's not how this plays out in, uh, in a first-person shooter, in the way this goes behind the scenes, right? So, I'm saying that's what I can I like to play with. Um, with that. Just, right? now, this is what makes the part, the part two and the part three with the spinning head, right? The spinning person. That's what makes it such a fascinating and difficult thing to solve. From a programming and a user input idea, how do we get past those curves? Cool. I have no idea how long this is, but I'm stopping it. If you've seen this whole thing, thanks for watching. Um, and uh, I'll catch you next time. All right? Adios. Take care.